Alright, now, a function of mathematics, what is it? It is, well, let me give you some examples. The function is what? I think so. It's more like a little square square. And that's not what it's supposed to be. Whoa! In mathematics, or in algebra, or in real life, there's all kinds of functions. First of all, there is the function that you see, I don't know if you're in a restaurant, or if you're in a, work in a restaurant, or living in a hotel room, or whatever, but it's usually something that looks like this. get it to work. But the old ice machines, you flip open the top and you scoop ice out of it. And in order for the machine to work, now yes, you could plug it in, but it won't work. What does it have to have, even if you did plug it in? What does it have to have? Ice. It has to have ice? Or it has water. to have water? Okay, it has to have water. And the outcome is ice. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say that I take a five gallon bucket, a five gallon bucket is about up to you need right here, about that big around. And let's say that I fill it full of cherry Kool-Aid. Okay? Full of cherry Kool-Aid. And instead of hooking this up to the water, I take a funnel and I put it right here into this water line and there's no water. And I pour that five gallon bucket of cherry Kool-Aid into the ice machine. What's going to happen? Cherry I'm going to get, how much am I going to get? I'm going to get five gallons of cherry ice cubes. So instead of, instead of doing that. I'm just going to have a bunch of little five gallons of not water, but cherry ice cubes. Okay? Did he come in? Oh, okay. Alright. So, what if I put five gallons of green Kool-Aid? Good morning, buddy. Have a seat. Green Kool-Aid gives me what? Green ice. Green ice. If I put in lemon Kool-Aid, I get five gallons of lemon ice. ice. So, what can we gather from this little scenario? What you put in, you get out. Exactly. And you take your handy dandy pencil and you write down whatever you put in, you get out. Now, that's going to come in later. It's going to come in, it's going to be very important later. This right here is called our input. This right here is called what? Output. Output. And this right here is called the function. I thought you said you were not an artist. I'm not an artist. That's pretty good. I feel good about myself. I won't need to put smoke packs on my truck. <laughs> Alright, so 
input. Since we're talking about functions, and since we're going to do this, uh, we're going to aim this toward algebra. Input could also be called what? X. X. And output can be called. Well, if x is the input and y is the output, then what is the function? There you go. Well, input in the x in terms of x is always called domain. And output in terms of y is called range. Let me give you an example of domain and range without algebra. Five gallons of water or five gallons of Kool-Aid will give me five gallons of ice. Two gallons of Kool-Aid, two gallons of ice. The range depends on what? The range depends on the domain. Doesn't go the other way around. Okay? We put, we hook the ice machine up, boom, there's two, three gallons of ice. Can that happen? No. No. You've got to have Kool-Aid before you can have the ice. It doesn't work the other way around. There's all kinds of examples of this. Let me give you another example. coming from that direction. Miss Turner, do you think you can make any more noise? <laughs> Alright, what is this? Bicycle. Bicycle. Output is movement. Input is work. Work with legs. Let me ask you a question. If you don't have any legs and you sit on that bicycle, what's going to happen? You're going to fall over. You're going to fall down. I used that one time and people got offended. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's called physics. Alright? If you, okay, let me ask you another question. If you don't have any arms and you fall into the ocean, you're going to drown. You're going to drown. There's no offending. You can't swim. You can't tread water if you don't have arms. Alright? If you get on this bicycle and you don't have any legs, you're going to fall down. You have to have some form of what? You've got to have some form of input. Input gives us movement. If we need, if we need more speed, then we have to what? Work harder. More work. All right. This depends on this. This is your input domain. This is your output range. This is your function. And you can use this all day long. All kinds of applications are domain and range and input and output. Now, hey, Baylor, same thing. I'm just going to draw a box. I'm not going to draw. Hey, Baylor, same thing. You put in hey, the function, you get hey, Baylor. Now, this is just like the ice machine. It takes one form and turns it into what? Another. Another form. This takes hay, they lay on the ground. After it cures, it turns it into a bale, so you can move it. That's all it does. This goes to this, so you can put it in a glass. This changes. There's all kinds of function realities, I mean, uh, scenarios. And this, x, 2x plus 4, and y. And now you can take all of these and you can turn it basically into y equals 2x plus 4. Here's your input. 
This is your function. And this is your output. Okay, so why is domain and range a part of it? Well, let me just tell you something about domain and range. Domain can be affected. Dot, dot, dot. One, by direction. In other words, the directions in the book, or the direct, I mean, the directions in the homework, or direction in on the test. It can be affected by the teacher. Or it can be affected because of the function. Dot, dot, fractions, and radicals. Radicals with an even index. All right, these two you'll be able to tell right quick because the directions will say only use x is between negative two and positive two. The teacher will say, only use x is equal to negative 2 or positive 2. This one will not tell you. This one you have to know. Now, if the domain is affected, what can you ascertain about the range? If the domain is affected, then what? Then the range is affected. Why? Because whatever the domain is. The range depends on what? The domain. Okay, so if the range is affected, I mean, if the domain is affected, then the range is affected also. And you will see this in just a minute. I'll just give you an example. Because the range depends on the domain. Now, I spend a lot of time talking about the ice machine, the hay maker, the hay, the hay baler, the bicycle, and this, because the rest of the stuff you've been doing since you were in pre-algebra, you just don't know it. And this, you need to realize, because when I give you a problem, you're going to have to see how it's affected, especially right here. So. If it's not a fraction or a radical, chances are the domain is going to be all real numbers unless these two take it. And these two are going to be in the directions or are you going to hear me say it? Okay, because this basically is, this is done by this. In other words, if I give you a test question, it might already have the directions on it that says the domain is fake. Okay? So let me give you a couple of examples. y is equal to x squared. Is this a fraction or a radical or just an exponential? It's an exponential. So it's not a radical and it's not a fraction. You don't have any directions about the domain and range. So, therefore the domain is going to be all real numbers. And the range is going to be all real numbers. Why? Because there's nothing that will blow up the calculator. There's nothing that will give you an error. There is nothing that will say does not exist. Let me give you an example. Let me show you. Negative 10, negative 9, negative uh, 6, negative 4, negative 2. 0, 2, 4, 6, 9, 10. I just picked out some random numbers. And you can put a negative, um, 11, uh, negative 12 right here and a positive 12 here. It doesn't matter. What's negative 12 squared? 144. What's negative 10 squared? 
What's negative 9 squared? 6 squared. 4. 6 times 4, 4, 0, 4. Well, let's plug in negative 3 halves, or negative 5 halves. Yeah, 5 halves? Is that 2 and a half? Well, negative 5 halves is going to give you negative 25 over 4. Uh, let's put in 1 half. That would be 1 fourth. Um, let's plug in 0.5. It would be 0.25 or whatever it comes out to be. In other words, is there anything that I can plug into this problem and it'll give me a does not exist or an error on your calculator? No. And usually, anything that's exponential is usually this. You need to write that down. Anything that's exponential usually is this. Unless what? Unless the teacher or the what? The directions say otherwise. In other words, here's what you'll see if it say otherwise. Y is equal to X squared. X is between negative 5 and what? 5. So that means that when you do your little handy dandy table here, can I use negative 100? No. No, I can only use negative 5. Negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Can I use 6? No. no. Can I use 6 and a half? No. no. I can only use negative 5 to 5. So my domain is from negative 5 to what? 5. My range is from 25 to, from 0 to 25. Because this is 25, and this is 25, and this is 0. So my y's are going from 0 to what on both sides? 0 to 25. So your range is from 0 to 25. And the way you look at that is this. It's a parabola like this. And that's what we're going to get into. This is negative 5. This is positive 5. And this is what? 25. And this is 0. So my domain is from negative 5 to what? Because that's my input. And what's my range? From zero to what? And what is that? That's my output. Mm -hmm. And the range is affected because of what? The domain. And that's what you got to realize. There's two types of problems. There is the problem when the domain is affected. There is the problem that the domain is not affected. Not affected is all real numbers, all real numbers. And that's usually your exponentials. Unless, what happened on this one? I gave you, as the instructor, I gave you the domain. I gave you something that was, I gave you something that was different than normal. If the domain is not affected, then you assume it's what? All real numbers. If you don't see anything in the directions or anything that I say on the problem, then if it's an exponential, chances are it's going to be all real numbers, all real numbers. No, all real numbers on the domain, but your, domain, your range. Is there any negatives in this problem? No, because the parabola starts where? <coughs> right here and goes up. So you're... So this one, the range is not going to be all of the numbers. The range is going to be from zero to infinity if it was all real numbers on the domain. Because it would keep going. And these arrows are not correct. These arrows need to be what? Dots. And they're closed dots because of what? Okay. That right there makes them closed dots. Okay? Give me that. Why do you have a bag? I'm going to show you something. Well, not right now, okay? You have to quit. All right. Question on this. All right? Now, what about x to the third? x to the fourth, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, x to the seventh. 
all real numbers, and then whatever the graph tells you on the range, unless specified by directions or by the feature. All real numbers. And what about this? What is that? It's an exponential, but what is it? It's a fraction. What cannot happen in a fraction? That's okay. That, that's, that's, you can have that. But what can you not have in the bottom? What number can you not have in a fraction? Huh? Zero. zero. Enunciate. Enunciate means zero. Not, you know. Uh, like, if I say it, I, I might get it wrong if he understands what I'm saying. There. Zero. <laughs> I cannot have zero in the denominator. One over zero equals does not exist. And it makes the uh, Bible, I mean the calculator, it makes it go crazy and then the student goes crazy because the student depends on the calculator. But what is the only number that will give you zero in the denominator? In this case, zero. All right. So my domain for this function is all real numbers, but that's a comma. X cannot equal what? Zero. Zero. And you just establish the domain for this function. Now we're going to get to the range, but what's going to happen is you're going to have a function. One over x squared looks like this. Like that. Like, no, positive. That's like negative. Yeah. Negative one. Negative one gives you a positive. That'd be the volcano. Okay. Volcano. All right. So. You can say that this, this arrow goes that way, and this arrow goes that way, this arrow goes that way, and this arrow goes that way. So the range, I mean the domain is what? Negative infinity to what? Positive, Positive infinity, but you have to stop at where? Zero. Zero, because you can't use zero. So it stops right here with a parenthesis, and starts right here with a parenthesis, meaning you can't use zero. So it would be negative infinity negative. to zero with a parenthesis. Use and we'll get to this eventually. And then it takes off at zero and goes to positive infinity. Parenthesis means that you can't touch it. You can't use that number. Bracket means you can. That's interval notation. We'll get to that eventually. What is the range? Well, the range is from zero to what? Infinity. infinity. Because the range is not affected by this right here. It's affected, but it's not affected like this is. It's just from zero to infinity. Can you touch zero? No, you cannot, because these things, they keep going, but they never touch zero, so it would be zero to the range. It's from zero to infinity. What about a radical? y is equal to the square root of x minus 2. Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is establish where 0 is with the radical. Because you can take the square root of 0, the square root of 0 is 0. So set the radicand equal to what? 0. So you can have 0 in the, in the radicand. So 2 will give you 0. So let's just draw a 2 here on the number line. And let's talk about what numbers we can use in this function. So, can we use 3? 3 minus 2 is what? Can we use 4? 4 minus 2, yeah, that's positive. 5, 6, 7. What about negative 3? Negative 3 will give us a what? And you can't take the square root of what? Negative. So, we can't use negative 3. 
but we can use 3, 4, and 5, and we can use 2. So what numbers can we use? We can use all numbers above what? 2. So our domain for this function is all real numbers, except x has to be greater than or equal to what? 2. two. Or you can just leave this off and say all real numbers greater than or equal to 2. Let's see what the, the range looks like. Let's see, the range, the, uh, there's our 1, 2, there's our x. So range is from zero to what? Keeps going. So it just keeps going. I'm exaggerating. It just keeps going like that. It just keeps going. So our range, that zero right here. What is the range doing? It keeps going. So our range is from zero to infinity. And you can touch zero because square root of zero is zero. So you can use zero. So that's it. That's how you that's how you know the difference between domain and range. Domain is input, range is output. Now, the good thing about this is y'all been dealing with functions since pre-algebra. Let me just show you the difference. In pre-algebra, they told you that the, you had x plus 3, you had that function, and then you had this function, and they told you to add it. Okay? x plus 2 plus x minus 2. That's distribute that one, distribute that one, you get x plus 2 plus x minus 2. What happens to the 2s? Well, you start off with 3. Okay, three. What's three minus two? One. one. And what's x plus x? Two x. Okay, so y'all remember doing that. Y'all remember doing this. It'd be x plus three minus x minus two. And distribute that. You get x plus three minus x plus two. And x minus x? And 3 plus 2. Uh, and then we were told to do what? Multiply x plus 3 times x minus 2. Use your f o y l. x squared plus x minus 6. And then you were told to divide, which you can't divide, but all you do is you put it over each other x plus 3 divided by x minus 2. We can't do anything with that. We just read that one. So, what's the difference in this and what we're doing now? Well, you've got to hold the pinky up now. And you've got to say, instead of x plus 2 plus x plus minus 3, you've got to do this. Hold the pinky up and go, f of x is equal to x plus 3 and g of x is equal to x minus 2. I guess that's what I have, right? Did I have x minus 2 or x plus 2? What did I have? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. sure. Alright. And now I want f plus g of x. Well, what are you going to do? Add them together. What you learned back in pre -algebra. No x plus 3 plus x minus 2. I'm not going to go through and do it again. But you get 2x minus what? Plus 1. f minus g of x. Same thing. And I think we've got what there? Five. Five. F times G of X. You're going to get X squared minus X plus 6 or minus 6 or something like that. Plus 3. 
And then f divided by g of x is equal to x plus 3 over x minus 2. Now, you laugh, but what's the difference? There isn't any. There isn't a difference. There isn't. You're just doing it a little fancier way. Well, Hubert, what about all that stuff that you do, you do with the... What, what about this? F of 3. What does that mean? Well, that means you flip the 3. Let me show you an example of this. Yeah. F of X is equal to X plus 3. And I want to know what F of 3 is. Well, <clears throat> this is the same thing as taking the pre-algebra thing that we just did. <coughs> Putting it in a 3 for X. And what did you do back then in pretty often? You took that 3, plugged it in, you got what? Six. And that's what you got in pre-algebra. Now you're going to pinky up and you don't do this. This is, this is red dead. You do this. That's the only difference between these two. But what if you have this, Hubert? What if you have f of x? is equal to 7. Well, by now you should have seen that f of x is just a pinky way of writing what? Y. So what does this say? Y is equal to what? So what do you do if you have y is equal to 7? What do you do? You set y is equal to 7 and you do what? How do you get rid of a positive three? Subtract. Take it across the river. And you get four is equal to x. And then you go back and you rewrite it. F of four is equal to seven. What I'm trying to tell you is do not let the pinky in this section mess you up. Because you've been doing this stuff since you were in pre-algebra. Okay. Now there is one that I will show you that can be a little bit confusing to you. Do you remember doing something like this in algebra one? You had two equations, y is equal to 2x plus 4, and then you had 2x plus 3y is equal to 4. You remember seeing this before? And the teacher told you that if y is equal to this, what do you do with that 2x plus 4? And then solve. You remember doing that? That's called substitution. You've done it before. All right? 2x plus 3 times 2x plus 4 is equal to 4. And 2x plus 6x plus 12 is equal to 4. And what? 8x. 8X plus 12. And then that's going to be a minus 8. Yeah. X is equal to negative 1. Okay. Now, this is all about 9. This is what I want you to see right here. All I care about is this part right here. You took 2x and you put a big set of parentheses right here and you put that 2x in there. That's what composition is. Okay? Now, once I, once I explain, okay, that's enough. And once I explain to you the f composed of g and g composed of f, all you have to do then is just think. f of x is equal to 2x plus 3. g of x is equal to x plus 2. Now, there's two types of compositions. There is f composed of g and g composed of f. Fog and gone. Okay. And the reason you know 
the difference between these and multiplication is this is a what? Open circle. F composed of G means you're going to rewrite F with big parentheses. F composed of G means you're going to rewrite what? G with big parentheses. With big parentheses. And when you use big parentheses, that means you're going to plug each other. So, here we go. Rewrite F with big parentheses. Two big parentheses plus three. And then what am I going to plug in right here? G. And I'm going to write this in red. Because I took X plus two And I plug it in. No, y'all. No. All right, everybody see that? Now, why am I going to do golf? How am I going to do G composed of F? Opposite. I'm going to rewrite. G with big set of parentheses. And what am I going to plug into the big set of parentheses? F. And now you're just going to do both of them. Simplify. Distribute the 2. That's going to be 2x plus 4 plus 3 is 2x plus what? 2x plus 7. So F composed of G is equal to 2X plus 7. You got a 1 here. 2X plus 3 plus 2 is equal to what? 2X plus 5. So G composed of F is equal to 2x plus 5. Now you need to mark this note entry right here because out of all the function stuff you're going to be doing, this one is the one that's going to get you a little bit confused when you see it for the first time. And all you got to remember is when you do FOD, you rewrite F with big parentheses. And when you do GOF, you do rewrite G with big parentheses. And if you rewrite G, that means you're going to plug in what? F. If you rewrite F, that means you're going to plug in G. Now, you will get F of F. If I do G, if I do F composed of F, that means I'm going to take rewrite F with big set parentheses, and what am I going to plug in big set parentheses? Same thing. Same thing, 2x plus 3, and then you're going to work it that way. You will see F composed of F. You will see G composed of G. Not normally. Usually you see these. Okay? Well, here, what about graphing? Graphing's the same way. The stuff that you learn in graphing, and we're going to go over that, applies to... The only difference is, back in pre-algebra, everything was like this. Okay. Y is equal to mx plus b. Now it's just going to be this. F of x is equal to 2x plus 3. F of x is equal to negative 4x. No difference. It's the same. Still going to do it this way. If you want to graph. Still going to do it the same way. No different. Except for now, we don't get to do it on graph paper. We'll get to the computer out when it's done. It's a document. No, it really doesn't make a difference whether you use graph paper or not. No. Sit down. Let me show it when we get finished.
Where'd you learn the magic trick? Oh, okay. Well, you can show everybody after. <laughs> I showed everybody your picture. All right, let's you pull up. Me too much. Mm -hmm, I know. That's you Okay, I can pull up pictures of you in the bathtub if you want me to. Okay, be quiet. All right. Let's look at. I have no idea. What we do? Three point six. Does it? Does the silver say three point six, three point seven, and then what? Seven point one, seven point two, seven point three, seven point four, seven point five. All the way to seven point. Okay, so I'm gonna look at three point six. And see what kinds of problems we're talking about. All right, these are all these are going to be y is equal, so you're not going to have to worry about f of x. Go ahead and work this problem right quick. I'm going to go get some handouts right quick. No, I can't get them because they're locked up in the next room. Okay, go ahead and and we'll go over the three. It says find the slope and the y-intercept. Remember what you did with your slope and y-intercept back in pre-algebra. If not, I'll go over it right quick. That, does that mean I don't know what I do, what I'm doing, or what? What does that yeah. mean? Okay. That's why I need to get into the next room. Let me go see by chance if it's open. No, it's not. I left them under the. Did you get them? Okay, there's three methods of graphing. I'm going to go over them right quick. Should you know them? Yes. But I'm going to go over them right quick. The first method is called, and I'll give you all a handout tomorrow on these. The first method is called building uh, the chart plot method. Chart plot method basically y is by itself, 2x plus 4 and you draw a line like this, x and y, and you pick out negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. 90% of the time, I'm going to pick these numbers. Why am I going to pick those numbers? One, they're easy. They're small numbers. Two, they're negative and positive, so they're both sides of the zero. Three, there's five points, so I don't go mess up on one. I got four other points that will keep me from messing up the graph. So that's why I use those five numbers. 10% of the time, I use multiples of the denominator. So that means there's a what in the problem? Fraction here. Yeah. So 1 half x plus 2. I'll use negative 4, negative 2, negative 0, 2, and 4. 
All right, that's the first method, chart block. Y'all should recognize, especially this right here. Y'all should say, oh yeah, I remember doing that. Walter, please stop it. X, Y, and pick out those numbers y'all remember doing that. The second method I call intercept method. This is where you don't see this one much because teachers don't like to teach it because they have to, you know, the student has to think a little bit. And they don't like that. They want to just program you and get you out of class. All right, x intercept, zero for y. Y intercept. Y intercept. Another day I beat it on the side and it worked. I think that button is kicking is what's happening. Zero for X. Zero for Y. Zero for Y. Zero for X. And it's always that way. And this is used when Y is not by itself like this. 2X plus 3Y is equal to 4. And you plug in zero for X for Y right here. You get X is equal to 2. 2X two is equal to 4. And divide by 2, x is equal to 2. And then you plug in 0 for x, you get what? 3y is equal to 4, y is equal to what? 4 thirds. Alright, now I shouldn't have to go over that anymore. Y'all should remember that. And if you wasn't shown that, then you either wasn't paying attention or they didn't show you. That's the second method of graphing. The third method of graphing. It's what I call building a line. And I use it when y is by itself. Y is equal to 2x plus 4. And this is where you just extract info. This right here is the sign of your slope. This right here is your slope. And this right here is your y-intercept. And you plot the y-intercept. One, two, three. There's your y-intercept. Your trace line is the red line. It's going to be a very faint. I'll do it in red, but it's going to be very faint. You see that line right there? Why is it left to right positive? Because you have a positive. Because I have a positive in front of the two. So how do you know it's left to right positive? Well, which way do we read? Left to right. So you put your car right here. What's that car doing? Right left to right. It's going uphill, so that's positive. Simple as that. And then you build your line. Take your blue and you go two up or two down, it doesn't matter. Two down, one, two, one over, because you trace lines over here. Two down, one over. Two down, one over. Let's say you don't want to go down. Let's say you want to go up. Go two up. Where's the trace line? Over here. One, two. And there's your line. Okay, so that's your three methods. Hopefully I knocked some cobwebs loose. And you're going, oh yeah, I remember those. Now I'll give you some handouts tomorrow when we, remind me when we open this room that I need to open the next room because they're in the kitchen station in the next room. But I give you three handouts, these, it goes over the page, front and back on each of these to give you an example. All right? Now, what's the problem they give us? What does it say? Y is equal to what? 
I'm sorry, what? Negative 3.8 plus 4. Okay, so we take our handy dandy blue marker, and that's that. Our handy or red marker, whatever. Red marker, like this, and green is that. So, if we use method 3 here, we take our 3 fourths, that's the red marker. 3 fourths is going to be, well, there's one right here, 2. So, 3 fourths is going to be right here. There it is. And blue is negative, so I'm going to take my handy dandy vertical line maker. We're going to make it blue, and it's going to be very small, and it goes like that, left to right down. How do you know it's left to right down? Well, we reach from left to right, put your car here, and which way is it going? Downhill. Why is it so hard to explain slope to people? I don't understand that. Unless y'all start reading from right to left, my salon. That means you're from the Middle East. And what's left? Well, we start here, take our green marker, and we're going to go two up, I mean four up. I'm sorry, I just, I just, I just do anything fast seconds, I'm sorry. That's what happens when you get in a, when you get in a hurry. And then I'm just going to erase everything. The y-intercept is 4, not 3 fourths. So let me fix that. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. The green goes right here. There's our y-intercept. Our negative is still negative, it's blue. Now, do you notice, am I worried about how shallow the angle is? No. All it's got to do is left to right and be in a downward trend. You can make it, you can make it very steep. You can make it very shallow. As long as that car is doing what? Going, down. going downhill, rolling downhill, you're okay. It's just a trace line. It just shows you what to do. And now I take my handy dandy red marker. And you don't have to go down, you can go up. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Now I'll go down until I'm running out of here. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Whatever. That's why you gotta have a graph graph paper, because I didn't do that exactly right. But anyway, you get the point. Now if they was to ask you to graph it, that's how you would graph it. Now once you draw the red line, what do you do with the blue line? You erase it because it's just telling you what to draw. Now again, these two sections should be review. The slope is what? Actually the slope is three fourths. The direction of the slope is negative. But they're going to ask you for negative three fourths probably. because they don't think out of the box like I do. Find the slope and the y-intercept. What do you got to do in order to find the slope? Get y you got to get y by itself. So I'm not going to go through that. Y'all know how to do that. Find the slope. I'm just seeing if there's anything I haven't reviewed because this is a review section. All right, find the slope-intercept equation. There's two formulas that you need to be reviewed on. And here are the two formulas. Well, actually three. One's an equation. Y Y is equal to MX plus B. That is the equation. Where this is your output. This is your slope. This is your input. Uh, 
I'm trying to get a lot done today. That's why I'm making mistakes. And this is your y-intercept. Everybody with me? So that's one thing. That's an equation that you need to be. That's kind of a basic equation that you should know. Okay? That's one. The other one, the other two formulas, calculate slope. Sometimes they're not going to ask you to find the slope. Finding the slope is setting y is equal to, I mean, get y by itself and find what? M. That's how you find the slope. Calculating the slope is when you use this. M is equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1. So if I've given two points, 3 comma 2, 5 comma 8. Which way we read? So this is x sub 1. This is y sub 1. This is what? And now what do you do? Plug and what? So this ain't hard. And to this day, if you ask me to do one of these problems, I don't care if I'm showing you how to do it or if I'm just doing it to see what the answer is. Well, do you see me use parentheses? Yes, and I got three degrees. So if I still use parentheses and I have three degrees, what does that tell you? You should use parentheses. When should you get out of doing it? Never. Because there's two things that y'all hate. What are they? Fractions and negatives. And until you love them, which nobody ever does, you need to use those parentheses. So, what goes here? Not hard, that. It's not hard at all. Why do people can't why 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 can't people do it? I think so. Or they don't listen. They're too busy doing whatever they do in class. That's how you calculate the slope. So this is the one important equation. That's the formula. This is just an equation. That's the one most important. And here's the second one called the point the slope equation. Why do you call it the point-slope equation? Because you use it when you're given a point and a slope. Y minus Y sub 1 equals M times X minus X sub 1. Now it looks intimidating, but it's not because all you got to do is do what I did in this, this way or this point. You're going to be given a point And a slope. Which way are we read? So this is x sub 1, this is y sub 1. Now what do you do? Plug and plug and shut. Y minus parentheses equals parentheses times x minus parentheses. What goes here? 4. What goes here? And we'll go through. Okay. And now you solve for y. Y is equal to 1x minus 3 plus 4, so it'd be 1x plus 1. And that's the equation for this line. That's the equation. Y is equal to x plus 4. Is this a review over Algebra 1 material? Yes. If there's anything you didn't get into a lot in Algebra 1, it's probably going to be this. But you should have gotten at least into this. So, what do we do here? This is x sub 1 and y sub 1. So, y minus parentheses is equal to parentheses times x minus parentheses and what goes here? Five. And what goes here? Eight. And what goes here? Zero. Y minus five is equal to eight x minus zero. Now what? Y is equal to what? Good. That's what I heard. I heard. Good. 
Enunciate, what does that mean? That means if something sounds like something, you need to make it sound like that, not an uh, I don't know what one of them is. Alright, I'm going to ask it again. Y is equal to what? 8x plus 5. That, that's enunciation. 8x plus 5. And that is your answer. 8x plus 5. I'm going I'm going to start answering y'all's questions like that. When y'all ask me, Hubert, can you explain to me? How would y'all like that? Alright, show your trick while, while I get the roll. I didn't get it right. Oh, Y is equal to. It's a magic ball. It's a magic ball. Alright. Wow! Awesome. Invisible ball! That's awesome. You are so smart. <laughs> let's see, let's see, let's see. I'm here. I'm not. Let's see, everybody's here except for Miss Perdue, right? Alright, y'all get out of here then. Oh, let me, st somebody hit my button over there.